Well, welcome back, Reg readers. Today we're talking about blades, uh, something that perhaps we haven't talked about enough. We certainly haven't talked about it for a while. They were around a little bit. They dropped out the news. Now they're back in them. We're going to be telling you in the next hour why they are back in them. And so when we asked, when, uh, when the guys came to us and said, would you do a Regcast about blades? We said, why? And uh, one of the, uh, so what we came up with is the idea that, you know, sure, they're not new but you've got sprawl, you've got management problems. We know about that. We've talked about that quite a lot this year on our RegCast. And so you do a good job of your blades, then maybe you can sort that out. Now, who's gonna be telling us about this? Well, again, another first timer to the studio, Julian, welcome. Yes, morning, Tim. Um, so yes, I'm Julian Keach. I'm mm -hmm. a blade business development manager in HP. Yep. Been there for pretty much forever, actually. Been about 30 <laughs> years in the IT industry now. Um, <laughs> and about 14 years dealing with um, Prime for HP. So yeah. uh, broad experience across the range. So is going to blades, is it, uh, is it a reward or a punishment? <laughs> <laughs> Not a reward, obviously. Oh, okay, yeah, that's just, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, that's fine. Uh, Julian, oh, the, um, although blades, you know, they have been around since... Well, mm, 2013, 14 years, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. They're still not the dominant hardware that you're going to find in a data center. No, that's right, which actually is quite surprising, and I think we'll, we'll cover that in our discussions, uh, get to some of the details. But um, I think perhaps there's maybe a fear factor about Blaze and, and people actually understanding what Blaze are, but you know, conceptually they haven't changed when we first introduced them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the demands on the business, though, today, are greater than they've ever been. We talked about um, sprawl, yeah. hardware to virtual sprawl. Um, how do you control that, actually? And I think blades are probably a very good answer now to how you actually manage that type of environment. So you have a technology for long enough, then sooner or later, Perhaps that's the, the problem comes along that it needs to solve. <laughs> no, but yeah, so the market is, what we're saying, though, is the market is coming to meet what blades do absolutely, better. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, than perhaps it was in the past. Uh, thanks. Now, also uh, joining Julian in the studio, he's back again. Dr. Stats, the Dark Lord. Welcome back, Tony. Thank you very much, Tim. Good to be here, as usual. Absolutely. Now, uh, although blades have been around for a while, it's just a blink of an eye in your career, which spans basically eons, eons. A, a, electricity, really, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, Blade, something you like? I like the idea of integrated infrastructure generally. So mm -hmm. blades give you a single point of management, something that's easy to implement, mm -hmm. takes away a lot of the back of rack mess. And I've had some very messy racks that I've managed to put together mm -hmm. um, and just make things generally easier to use, easier to keep going, L fewer opportunities to make, mess things up. Oh, good. You're going to be telling us more about your messy rack. In the, in if the anyone can mess on. things up, it's me. Good, good <laughs> stuff. Now, before we get going, just to remind everybody, uh, do ask questions. There's a little button that if you want to ask questions, you can ask questions that come in on here. I ask the guys and they give you an answer. It worked really well last time out because there were a ton of questions and they were really useful to us because they helped us decide what we were going to talk about after you asked the questions. So please do. No question is too stupid because no question is going to be more stupid than the one I'm going to think up, that's for sure. And uh, so please ask them. And uh, please, if you've got any comments or any of your experiences as well, please let us know about that. Because if we're saying things that you don't think are authentic or real, then let us know. And we'll put that out as well. And I'll ask Julian and Tony about that. So uh, let's get going on this. Um, now, Julian, there's, oh, we, we have talked a little bit about how, uh, already about sort of how blades have been around for a while, and it's what, they're about 20% of the market? Yeah, roughly 20% of the market. It's about 20% yeah. about 20, it's about yeah. 20 of the market at the Absolutely. moment. But you're saying that there's a, a lot of things coming up now that are going to mean that, well, hopefully for your, you know, hopefully your bonus, I suppose, the <laughs> sales will be more popular bonus in the future. Sales. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think you know, this, 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 some of the statistics you see on this uh, on this particular slide. I mean, okay, so it's uh, uh, the, the wow numbers. You know, not yeah. they're going to apply necessarily to everybody out there, but I mean, there are some ridiculous numbers, and, and this is the direction that the market uh, is heading in. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of opportunity in there for uh, for people to you know they can manage their infrastructure to deliver services much quicker. Um, and I think the key message you know, is actually what's in the centre of that. Mm -hmm. you know, IT requires you know, more simplic simplicity. Um, better efficiency and agility, and, and, and that's blades down to a T in how you deploy and manage them. Mm -hmm. well, so a lot of people criticise, but people who don't like blades, they, they're not necessarily, you know, they're, they're supposed to be cheaper, they're not especially cheaper. 
they don't give you the agility because you're locked into some proprietary blade design, that sort of yeah. thing. Are you sure that they really are the answer for these sort of things? Well, I think that's a common misconception because I think you know, when blades first appear, we originally marketed them as actually as a rack server on its side and a different form factor. Yeah. Um, so I mean, if you like, if your definition of locking is you know is the is the physical nature of that product unique to any vendor, then that's that's true across any. Uh, any vendor out there, and, and that actually applies to, to racks and tower servers as well. Um, I mean, the key concept of Blaze is what goes on inside it and what leaves it is down to industry standards. Um, mm. So, you know, these things connect up to uh, networks and storage um, uh, networks, fabrics, uh, as would any other server. Mm. Um, to those devices, they look like a series of network connections or a series of HBAs. Mm. Um, but you obviously get the benefit of actually having, you know, that, that converged and managed um, set of infrastructure. Mm. You agree, Tony? Yeah, and again, it's that first contact. You're talking about the idea in people's heads that the blades were expensive, um, locked in, and that there's a lot of control wrapped around them. Mm -hmm. um, that's maybe something that might have been true back in Generation 1, 14 years ago. Well, back in the uh, old days, the back in the chassis up, yeah. thing used to be expensive. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what's the cutover point for buying a blade system versus just buying more um, servers to stick in your rack. Yeah. Um, that was something that initially there was quite a high cutover, so you needed a lot of servers mm -hmm. before it became almost economically justifiable, at least in terms of the acquisition costs, which is often the biggest challenge that everybody faces given yes. the, the budget pressures. And, you know, operational costs are much bigger, but a lot harder to um, actually monitor and calculate and therefore report back on in mm -hmm. terms of business terms. So therefore that idea that blades were really expensive is something that maybe was true 14, 15 years ago, much less the case today. So changing people's perceptions after first contact is often really difficult in IT, the same as anywhere else. Yeah, so the, uh, the startup cost has gone down I can say startup cost in its loosest sense, but to get in the cost of that, then that makes this whole agility message that we're talking about now more possible, more feasible. And again, the, the idea that people have of blades and where they're good and where they fit might be 10, 14 years out of date. Because again, the business has changed, as we've just been talking about, but also the technology to a degree has changed. The theory of it hasn't, but the actual systems themselves have moved on leaps and bounds, including the whole management side too. Oh, that's good, which is, you know, we're going to, we're going to be spending most of our time today talking about Absolutely, what has yeah. changed there and, and well, why they are different. I think uh, so yeah. one key element I wanted to, wanted to talk about there as well is, and you, and you alluded to the point about Blaze only being 20% of the market. You know, we still see in the region of 45, 50% maybe of the market being deployed as racks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you continue to scale racks and have a design to reach those targets uh, using the practices we have now? I mean, you know, to, to coin a phrase from an old sci-fi movie, you can't even change the laws of physics. Ah. So there's only so much you can actually load into your data center that you can actually power and cool. So how are you going to do that if you continue just to deploy rack after rack after rack and you're creating a huge amount of sprawl? We know it's not just physical these days, it's virtual as well, but you know, still you're trying to scale to that kind of, that kind of volume. Scanning within Blaze is much simpler. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to work on that accent. Now the, the <laughs> other thing on this, we, you know, I, the, I, I want to check off. Last week we were in the studio yes. with, uh, with your colleague Clive mm -hmm. from, uh, and we were talking about converged infrastructure. So why at that we talked about many of the same problems. Mm. We talked about sprawl. We talked about management. Why would you need one well, and not the other? I mean, the blade, the converged system is actually is based on um, the building block of, of blade system. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of a converged system is you're buying a ready to go, pre built, uh, pre integrated. You know, built in the factory, wheeled in, plugged into your into your office ready to go basically so you have a specific need for maybe a specific number of um, virtual machines or maybe you're running a SAP HANA deployment or whatever it might be you're doing you can buy a pre-plumbed pre-configured wheel it in plug it in so it's it's simplicity and it's down to that usage case that you have you know with blade systems as I say this is a component building block effectively of converged systems so you can you can build your own Mm -hmm. But you've got many of the same advantages. 
in terms of a lot of the plumbing is pre-built in there so that you don't have to do so much of the hardware checking, the firmware checking, etc. That's all taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not tailored for a single service, a single business service. So yeah. it's not designed only to deal with desktop virtualization. It's not designed only to deal with Tap Hanna. It gives you mm -hmm. the ability to actually support a broader range of typical business services to give mm -hmm. you just a bit more flexibility. Right. So, it, yeah. So, 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 yeah. To, to, so, to recap, on the converge on the converge side, we were talking about specific types of workloads. We talked a lot about the um, desktop virtualization, didn't we? And we, you know, th those sort of things, big data. Yeah. Uh, those sort of things. So, if you know that you've got that, and you want to build something, and you want someone to do the hard pre-integrating work on that. If you need an That's optimized great. platform for a single business service, converge. If you've got a more generic set mm. of different business services that you're delivering out to your users, maybe the Blade system's a better approach. Um, but these converge, uh, these, these converge systems that we talk about, they are made of Blade. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it is simplicity. It's down to how a customer yeah. might want to purchase to that workload, or buy it by a workload, or buy it by a, a modular setup and, and build your own effectively. Mm -hmm. right. Wouldn't want to do that, to be honest. Now, today, Tony, this uh, this one, uh, this little stained glass yeah. window that you've produced this, this for us. Stained glass window, exactly. Yeah. So again, these are the sorts of challenges that the register audience tell us about time mm -hmm. after time, and they're all the things you'd expect. We talked about the top item already: physical and virtual service brawl. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the whole need to get operational work practices unable to keep up with the complexity of the infrastructure, as mm -hmm. well as the excess demands of users or the exceeding demands of users for faster and faster response to new requests. Um, we've got the whole idea that you know the register audience are basically keeping stuff going so they haven't got a lot of time to actually change things and manage the infrastructure more and more so we need better automation in there so that people can keep on doing their jobs effectively to deliver the business value. Um, but that's really compounded by the fact that because everybody out there is almost certainly using multiple management tools, you know, even you know, multiple server management tools as well as storage management tools and network management tools, that whole complexity of management is really hard to handle. You're doing lots of manual process as the integration point. So, you know, the guys out there and the girls out there watching us are the integration point. They're the plumbing that really keeps everything going. And underlying all that, of course, it has an impact on cost and the risk of operations because we know that it's when we change things quite often that service interruption occurs. Mm -hmm. When you talk to the register audience, this is all comes from the, these are the things that pop up when you talk to them. Yeah, yeah time after time. It doesn't matter what the particular yeah. area is we're talking about. These are the standard challenges that everybody out there faces day after day after day. On a really basic level, do you have blade conversations with them? Are they blade positive, blade neutral, or blade negative? I, I suspect that that really depends on the individual because yeah. some people, as we hinted at at the beginning, may have come across blades you know, 14 years ago and not looked at them since mm -hmm. because they weren't right for them then. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that the majority are pretty much blade neutral yeah. on the grounds that it, it's something mm -hmm. that may have been seen to be good for one particular area. 14 years ago, 10 yeah. years ago, but maybe hasn't quite seeped through because we've been too busy doing lots of other stuff. And so it's in that middle ground. That yeah. There's room for better understanding out there, absolutely. It's not generally speaking the sort of question you tend to ask, though, is it? Because, you know, yeah. it's a it's a hardware Because again, it's going yeah. to come down to, well, what's your work yeah. like? You know, so, so it's horses for courses. Yeah, so it's, we can actually do that now. If you do have experience of this, of some of these things, and, and, and it the ways in which blades have either worked or not worked for you, please do let us know in a couple of lines. Tell us what you did, how it worked, or what you're thinking of doing, and how you think it's going to work. Uh, because then we can put that in and we can uh, we, uh, we can see how that lines up with the sorts of things we are going to talk about in a minute. First of all, uh, Dr. Stats, yep. let's have a look at some of your stats. Again, these are some slides that we've used before where we've asked the register audience, you know, well, okay, we, we're talking a lot about virtualization, but how much have you actually done? Uh -huh. And, you know, lots of the marketeers would have you believe that virtualization has taken over the universe. Everybody's doing as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not quite true. Um, we've got lots of different levels of virtualization, and we, we cut the audience up into three different areas between those that have really adopted it, gone for broken, as you can see, lots of very dark blue bars they're there. They're the movers. So, so they're the ones that have really done a lot of virtualization across a, many areas, certainly the whole x86 and storage infrastructure side. Mm -hmm. But down to desktop environments and desktop virtualization, that's growing slowly, all the way down to the traditionalists that are really still 
with um, the sort of server and infrastructure estates that we've basically grown up with and haven't had time to change it. And in these cases, you know, virtualization is being adopted, but it's less advanced. So it's not a done deal. There's still lots of virtualization going on, lots of room to do more virtualization. Mm -hmm. That's the, the um, we, when we've looked at this, the, uh, you know, uh, Again, we, we looked at this over time. You, uh, the, has this closed up at all over time? Your movers and your traditionalists, are they getting more like each other on something like virtualization, which has been around for such a long time now? It's changing progressively as it seeps down. It's like everything, you know, that the, the dreamers and the movers who are really keen to this or have immediate business cases get on first, and then everybody else catches up over time. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a good question from Martin, actually, but I'm not going to do it because it's a bit sort of more detailed at the moment. So if you just hang on for a minute, Martin, we'll just get through. Uh, we'll just get through. That just sounds awful, <laughs> doesn't it? I'm terribly sorry. We will, uh, we will have a look at, uh, at Tony's analysis of the market and then we'll see. Yeah, because it's a good question. So let's have a look. So Green get, bars, red bars. Let's get through the next couple of charts. <laughs> I'm <quickly> sorry. <laughs> You're not going to forget that, are you? I'm terribly sorry. That's no problem. Um, again, th this is things where we've asked people how, do, how well do these apply in your own environments? And so mm -hmm. our teams are well integrated. Well, there's some green on there, but everybody agrees that we need to do a better job of actually yeah. pulling people together to make everybody work more efficiently to meet these increasing demands from users and the expectation window for when service changes can happen. Um, and moving down, you know, we've got some green bars there, but there are even smaller green bars when it comes to the operations and management processes are well integrated. Mm. So the teams are integrated in some cases, not in others. The processes, less so, it's still the people out there that are the integration engine. Um, the tools we use for managing systems, as we hinted at earlier, yeah. as you can see, that the number of dark green um, bar on the very left-hand side of the chart yeah. is tiny. Tiny, isn't it? You know, there's more red than there is dark green. Yeah. So there's plenty of room to actually get the management tools working together well. And whenever we ask people, do you want even more management functionality, or would you rather your management tools work better together, the latter response is always seen as being more desirable than the former. Mm -hmm. um, and the tools that we are using are fit for purpose. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. sort of, but you know. Not very good. Yeah, and this is after we've been doing this stuff for, you know, 20, 30 years yeah. in the x86 space. Yes. But, at the bottom of the chart, we've got something that has been growing over time, and that's the idea that we need to manage the infrastructure, not so much for the sake of managing the infrastructure, but yeah. as part of an IT service delivery culture. That is something that really is picking up you know, quite a lot in the register audience. This, this was part of the original Blade message, wasn't it, Julian? I mean, there was an efficiency message for Blade, but there yep. was there was a simplify your life message, as Absolutely, I remember, yeah. if I remember correctly, back all those years ago. And uh, has that really been picked up? Uh, well, it has by the uh, the numbers that have taken place, yes, but maybe not by, maybe but not the, by a the wider audience. People, yeah. um, I think it's something that, again, the idea was put out there, but the market's moving towards it because of all the pressures mm -hmm. that we've talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And actually, we've now got the management and the infrastructure solutions more able to meet that, you know, philosopher. Yeah. It's the ability to change as well, which is, which is critical. So yeah. rather than deploying something and it being set as it is, uh, you know, with a blade, it's actually quite simple to repurpose and change um, what's going on inside that infrastructure much, much more simply than it is with a, a rack full of rack servers, for instance. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So we get the next one. Yeah. Let's have a look. And, and the next one is great. Okay, so what's actually stopping you from changing? Yeah. And surprisingly enough, it's, okay, the cost of doing something new comes up pretty big, <clears> sure. um, both in terms of the ongoing costs of owning and running new solutions, as well as the upfront costs. Well, look at the big but, red bars, yeah. But, but yeah, they're the big red bars, but if you look at the red and yeah. yellow bars combined, lack of time. Lack of time. Lack of yeah. time, um, and then lack of knowledge. Yeah. So we, we really are just too busy doing everyday work to find out what find else out we could do differently. Yep. So how can we change? And that all translates into general inertia. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got stuff working, you, you go with it for as long as you can. But my suspicion is that we're gradually reaching a sort of tipping point in how much longer can we carry on, you know, with the systems and platforms that we've got. Yeah. The, the breaking point is almost becoming visible in many organisations. There's just not enough weekend time left to do everything. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough demand um, acceptance amongst the end users for delay. So all of these coming together so that that inertia is really reaching a breaking point. But now we've reached a time where it is possible to do more things in yep. what in, in you know, the blades 
version two, Return of the Blades. As, they've I, never been away. They've, I, no, they, <laughs> I was, I, you know, I started the sentence and then I thought I, I just have to finish it. The, um, uh, but in this, this, this inertia, is this a problem for you that you're having conversations with people who are thinking about the past? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's not a problem for us as HP. Obviously, we you know we have a, a broad range of, of product that we'll quite happily sell to to customers out there. But I, I mean, it, yes. Yeah. However, mm. you know, um, you know, going back to one of my earlier slides where you're talking about being able to grow and scale, you know, is actually deploying more hardware, more racks. Is that the most efficient process for you? If it is, I'll be surprised. Um, maybe someone will have a, a you know mm. a use case where they're actually quite happy doing that, and there may be some point cases where that's that's relevant. Um, but you know, I can't imagine there's anybody out there that doesn't want to simplify their data center, doesn't want to consolidate yep. down the number of components they have to deploy, uh, and manage, and power, and cool. Um, you know, why would you not? And, and back to your original point, you know, why not blades? Actually, hmm. now why, why would you not have blades? Let me just put in Mark's question here because you know it's quite specific, but it illuminates this kind of point that mm -hmm. with you know the market's moving towards us. He's saying, how important is it to extend the underlying uh, LAN intelligence into the blade chassis? So, you know, so, so yeah, we, we're talking about the sorts of things that people are starting to think about now, yeah, in, so, you know, in, in planning their data center. Yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that question is referring to some of the technologies, some of yeah. the you know, upcoming networking technologies. The fiber channel over Ethernet is very much a, a key technology. And that, again, that plays very, very well to Blades because you're, you know, you're consolidating your infrastructure down and actually you're converging your... I'm just stealing onto one of my later slides, actually. Uh, yes, exactly. I don't want to, I don't want to cannibalize that. I want to make <laughs> sure you are Martin gets some attention. Uh, you are converging your network as well as converging your, your, your servers and, your, and, and, and storage and, 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 um, and compute. Yeah, don't tell me more because you want to leave it oh. as a surprise. Hang okay. on for that because it's a good bit. I mean, you know, it's all good, but that's an especially <laughs> good bit. Uh, the, so you, to, to have a look at this, like a couple more things. Actually, this, this one's one of yours, isn't it? It Jim? is. Yes. It is. Well, everybody likes a picture. Mm. So if you can't visualise in your own in your own mind that uh, you know the, the business demands are growing greater than we'll the, do it for you than the, than the yeah. IT service can deliver, then there's your picture to actually to display that. But, but yeah, you know we talked about the ability to respond to requests from from the business, mm -hmm. um, and you know obviously we, the idea is to move away from those those elements that are, that are on the right there. We we we're still aware that um, businesses are operating as silos. Yeah. That's fairly common knowledge. I mean there are departments within departments which are acting. As silos, but and then across the different compute areas, or sorry, storage and networking and compute, we're still very much in a silo. Um, and I and I know from the experience of talking to some customers that they can talk about it being uh, you know average of ten weeks. I have actually heard sixteen weeks to deploy a new system. Mm. You know, so I, I'm you know that's probably more the case of deploying physical hardware than deploying a new virtual machine, obviously. Mm. Um, but if you you know, if you're going to report to your CEO that no, we can't deliver that new service you requested uh, until four months' time, I don't imagine that's going to go down very well. Mm. Um, and some of the beauties that we you know within Blades is a lot of it can be pre-provisioned, so you actually simply plug and play the um, the blade and away you go. Yeah. What pops from you on this, Dan? The, the big thing for me on this is the idea that we've got um, a lot of operational processes that are non-standard manual processes because mm. keeping this stuff working, as I said, it, it's down to the um, red readers out there. They're the people that keep all this stuff operating effectively. But they're doing that with a lot of manual processes, you know, which are probably not standardised except in people's heads. And so different people do things in different ways. It's really hard to automate. And as we deal with this increasing volume, the increasing complexity, you know, people changing stuff is that big service interruption mm. um, factor. 80% of service interruptions are caused by people changing stuff. So the more you can automate there, the more you can take the pressure off doing the routine, mundane, day after day stuff that's always the same. Automate that so that that the register readers can actually do more important things, responding to the business pressures that are being mm -hmm. placed upon them. I hope that for me is the big happens in the next 40 minutes, then, if it's all down to the reg readers. You know, <laughs> but I think you know, one budget. area we've not covered as well is, is budget. So yeah. if, you, if you're an IT department that's got a growing budget, then, well, happy days, because uh, you're, uh, you know, you're in the few, I would suggest. Mm. So, you know, I think quite often that the people, the IT departments, are often where you know, services and costs get, get cut, perhaps. Um, so you're trying to do the same things or more with actually less budget. 
Hmm. So you need to look at doing something different. So you have to move out some of the old practices that you've, you've been following uh, and look at different ways of doing that. Um, basically, the yeah. system's broken as it is. It's, it can't continue. It's hmm. the inertia thing again. Yeah. And that inertia also applies on the end customer side inside the business that quite often they've got silos. They've mm. got IT budget silos as well that makes it difficult sometimes to build a shared infrastructure to optimise things as well as they can do. Mm -hmm. And that internal politics can be a challenge for many of the readers out there too. Tony, you had a, um, an observation on Julian's clip art here. Uh, yes, I mean, it did look to me on the social side as if, you know, that's certainly something that I would have liked to do to some of my users in the past. So, yes. Yeah, String you, them up. You, you, yes. We Teach can't... them not to irritate me again. <laughs> if you were one of those users now, so just, so, you know, Tony's getting it out. Um, yep. it's part At of last, his, after all these part years. Part of his recovery. After all these years. Yeah. Now, so, okay, so let's, let's on, on these last couple of ones, yep. we'll go deeper into what this IT gap is. Exactly. According the, to the Reg Readers. The, these are the perfect visions um, yes. from the Red Readers, things that they'd really told Re us that how they would like, like the world to be. What, yeah. If we weren't starting from where we are today, if there were no inhibitors in what we've got already, how would we like things to work? Well, yeah, sure, we'd all like to be able to provision new workloads really quickly. You know, the green bars are well over 60% and there aren't actually very many red bars. Hmm. I'm not sure why this is not desirable at all, but maybe someone can tell me. <laughs> um, or it could have been someone contrary like me, just thinking ah, everyone's going to be going green, so I'll get the red. Yeah. Um, automation, yeah. yeah. We, we actually want to automate things to make sure that we can optimise the mm. use of our physical resources because we can't grow forever. Yeah. Even if we're losing, using blades, you know, we've got to make sure that we're using everything as effectively as we can. Again, seen as being highly desirable and taking the whole unified approach across um, servers, storage, networking, security, operational processes generally, highly desirable amongst the red readership. So yes, yeah, so Julian, your challenge, should you choose to accept it in the next half hour, so provisioning quickly, automation, unified approach. And getting the processes that can actually support those. Yeah. It's not just about the technology, it's the operational processes wrapped around it. Mm -hmm. And on the other half of what people would like? Yep, and again, so how does this actually translate? Um, what are we looking for? So we'd like server storage, networking, security, and other specialists all to work seamlessly together. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 80% people with a great idea. Um, we want the other parts of IT where we have them, you know, the developers, the testers, all of the support staff in particular, to have self-provisioning amongst their own IT resources. That seems being quite desirable as well. Letting end users actually have that self-provisioning capability, there's much less acceptance of. Sure. Mostly because, you know, people like me think that if you give users the opportunity to eat as much cake as they can, they're going to eat more they're cake than you have. Cake. They're never going to give you back what they're yeah. not using. So you've got to have some throttle on that, whether that's in terms of chargeback or some restriction, authorization, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But we still need to get some operational processes wrapped around things there. Um, again, this thing that we talked about earlier, the idea that IT activity would be much more around business services rather than systems. Mm -hmm. So it's about service delivery, it's not about infrastructure management. That's again something that's growing over time, we're up to almost two thirds already. Um, and then we want to be able to do good chargeback or at least reporting on IT resource usage so that, you know, if we've got departments or users that are really eating an awful lot but not paying for it, we've got some way of saying, look guys, you know, we've got a really optimised infrastructure but it still has physical limits on it, you know, okay, we can spin up virtual machines but they have to live somewhere. Who's going to pay for that? How can we reconcile that? This whole financing side is something that needs to change quite dramatically hmm. because of the way IT budgets have been set up in the past, very project by project, not about shared infrastructure, it's about one individual service. How can we get from that budgeting model to something better able to use resources effectively? Mm. Now, Julian, we're going to go in, in um, just in a second, we're going to discuss blades in more detail. Mm -hmm. Are we asking questions here to which blade is the answer? Or is these, or is these mm. basically, are these sort of technology neutral questions? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> Blades will not be the answer for everybody. I think mm. you can be quite quite sure of that. But, um, and there are obviously other many uh, different types of infrastructure out there that play to to different strengths. Yeah. Depending on what it is you, you're particularly doing with your um, your infrastructure. But you know, I think the point about Blades is that it is a it is a common compute platform. So whilst we may talk about it being very strongly used within virtualization, it doesn't necessarily have to be just virtualization. No. You know, the platform itself is, is you know, the same architecture you have within your, your racks or your towers. So 
um, what you choose to deploy in that is is quite up to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it will play to certain strengths, um, and, and I think yeah, they are. I mean, they are generic subjects up there, mm. um, and elements of that will be better managed with Blaze certainly. Yeah. So particularly the top bar. Yeah. The idea yeah. of server storage networking working seamlessly together, simple provisioning, easy management. Mm -hmm. That's something that Blades are a really good fit for because it's built as a system in the first place. Yes. And you've got the management tool There's wrapped a around it. There's a we use a lot, collaboration. You know, it's, it's collaboration of those different, those different entities within a data center. I don't think that's done very well at the moment. Um, it's very much an us and them. Yeah. Um, and this is an element of actually bringing, you know, converging that, that data center within an enclosure effectively. Let's have a look at that in some sort of, in, in some more detail then. Oh, there's that word convergence. And there it is. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, it's almost like you've planned this. Now, <laughs> the, uh, the, so tell us, so I, I mean, you know, this, so this is kind of like the moment. So let's have a look and, and to see the attributes of Blades, I guess this is. This yeah, the, well, as yeah. we started, I think, you know, the, so the, the common attribute of Blades was the, the fact that you're working on a shared infrastructure. So you don't have to power... Um, individual servers. You don't have to um, to call individual servers. You can manage that, um, that 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 enclosure and a lump, as I referred to earlier, which you quite liked. <laughs> yes. Um, but that lump of compute yeah. um, as a whole. Um, I mean, if you think of a typical, when you took the picture we had of rack servers earlier, when you have you know two power supplies, everybody wants mm -hmm. resiliency. Um, if you're running a virtualized instance, you'll have many cable connections to the back of your your rack server. Hmm. Um, you'll have a management connection of some sort. Um, that's for each individual server. There's an awful lot of mess, and again, it's a bit of a spoiler here, but there's a picture coming up which, which uh, you know, demonstrates that quite nicely. So the old concept of actually you know, managing that as a, as a whole and the, uh, the efficiencies just by doing that brings are quite staggering. Mm. Um, the other level of convergence we've seen, and we talked about in the question that was asked earlier, was about the convergence at the network side mm. as well. And again, we'll, we'll play on that in a, in a, in a later slide, but you know, the ability to actually consolidate down your, your uplink connections, mm -hmm. uh, and this is obviously so as you connect to your network, um, you know, this is often forgotten. We talked about you know, the, uh, the cost of blades at the start, and I think people analyze stuff and they look at a particular lump hmm. of compute, and they forget about the fact that actually it's saving you money in actually how you connect to your network. So rather than having in the old worlds, and we talked about 14 years ago when we first brought blades out, and everybody was using a patch panel. So every server, as with a rack effectively now, connects to a port in your network or connects to a, mm. a part of your storage fabric. That's all cost, that's all management. Um, each one of those costs of those cables, you know, I've seen it vary from 350 to $500 per cost per port. Mm. And the licensing you attach to your, actually, your, your uplink ports as well. So actually the fact that you can consolidate that at your network um, edge with inside your, your uh, blade chassis and send a signal out in a consolidated form, that's actually saving you cost, which often is actually forgotten um, and it may well be because different areas of the data center own that budget. Um, but as I say, that's, uh, that's something that is forgotten and is a, a tremendous saving. It's one of those costs that people live with and don't yeah. bother to calculate anymore because it's always been that way. It's one of those hidden costs that, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you bought the network, you know, five years ago and you're hoping you're not going to have to do much with it, <laughs> you know, for the foreseeable future. But yes. it does get pushed and broken. Mm -hmm. Okay. Federation. Yeah. Federation. Yep. Yeah. So Federation, again, we would... Um, you know, something that's very, very key in the way that, the, that we architecture a uh, blade system is that um, you know, these, the, the, the blades, the chassis, the chassis can operate into domains. You can operate mm. them in you know, anything up to a thousand uh, blade chassis in the domain for obviously the, the very large customers out there. But you can scale that as you require it. Um, all of those blades you know, it operate in what we refer to federated form. So whilst they're out there working in, a, in an autonomous way, doing what they do, um, they are actually managed and controlled by a central source. So we'll move on to that and some of the, the management talk we'll, we'll cover later. Yeah. So HP OneView will actually manage um, that from a single screen in your entire data center. So the federated piece is very critical because I mean any customer is going to have to factor risk into any, any deployment they make out there. You know, um, it would be realistic, catastrophic failures happen. Um, if you are, you know, monitoring your, your equipment correctly then, and it's a virtualized instance, then, you know, hopefully you have time to actually manage to fail over some of your virtual machines to something else that it limits the effect it has. But, you know, within the federated architecture, because these are acting uh, autonomously, you know, you're limiting any failure to just one of those, effectively one of those nodes, so potentially 16 servers in, the, in that failure domain. Now, if you're running in a hierarchical type, you know, tree and branch type structure, you know, a failure higher up that tree 
you know, has the potential to wipe out everything below it, which is a much larger fault domain, so a very higher level of risk there. The, yeah. the whole idea of the federated platform as well also ties into that way that IT is budgeted for and dealing with the internal politics that you know lots of the readers have. Um, some departments insist that you know we've bought this infrastructure we don't want anyone else using it. So this again gives you the ability to actually federate within the platform so that you can deal with the politics where they exist before people get used to the idea of sharing more. Tell and me, making so more efficient explain that usage. to me again. How does it help? Well, because you can federate things out into individual areas of you know responsibility and usage. You know, never mind failure. Mm -hmm. It can apply politically and economically mm -hmm. as well. Ah, uh -huh. okay. You know, to help you, if you do have siloed budget still, or you do have you know the marketing department that says, yes. look, we're paying for all this. We don't want to risk its um, performance being inhibited by anyone else using the platform because mm -hmm. maybe they're 15 years behind the times or 20 years behind the times in understanding how well you can run shared infrastructure. Now. Yeah, and, I, and I've seen from your you, you're, you're getting this this very strongly coming through yep. that these political time after time after time are things that hold back a lot of the nice to haves that yep. we put on our early slides. Yep. The, the, then, yeah. the IT infrastructure could advance much more quickly if only the business was ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the flexibility yeah. thing again. So you're not governed by some central you know, big brain, effectively. You are acting autonomously. So you're, you're almost mm. ring fencing what you do. However, you are still controlled and managed, uh, and, and you can report to a central entity as well. Got it. Yeah. Let, let, you know, uh, let us know on, on the balance of this sort of thing. Because I, I, you know, I, I sometimes think that we, we portray the world as a bit too nice almost um, when we're looking at things that are, are sort of good to have so really let us know what your genuine problems are on this sort of thing and we will uh, we'll try and deal with it now uh, automation automation obviously very key yes uh, we talked about that at the start you know automation is going to, to save you time to stop your um, you know your data center guys spending their time keeping the lights on as we say mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's the old adage that we've had in, you know, many times before, it's many repeated, you know, how do you, how do you manage what you can't measure? Mm -hmm. So within the, you know, the blade system uh, chassis, within the interconnects and fans, and actually the servers themselves, there are many, many sensors which are actually tracking everything that goes on inside that, um, that, that server or that chassis at any one given time, which then will report back to a central source. So that gives you ultimate um, you know, level of um, flexibility and manageability, you know, understand how much power you're drawing in real terms. So we talked about changing the laws of physics earlier. You know, often when people deploy um, servers in a data center, they'll deploy it at the face rating of that server. It says it uses 500 watts or whatever. It, uh, let's assign 500 watts to that server. It may not use anything like that. Yeah. With a blade chassis, you can control that. You know what power you're drawing in that particular server. You have the ability to manage it again as a lump. Mm. Um, you can move up and down within different, within different servers. Um, you can cap it. So again, you can do that because you can manage it. If you don't have that level of management capability with inside that chassis and that infrastructure, how do you know what's going on and how do you manage it? So you talk about returning power to the data center, you know, actually being able to manage more um, than you did previously based on having those efficiencies. And yeah. this is a big change as well. Um, five years ago when we asked the register audience how important was power monitoring? Yes. Inside the data center, the answer was usually it's somebody else's problem. You know, we don't pay the bills. Mm. Whereas now the whole of IT is recognized as being a relatively big consumer of power and so therefore it needs to be, you know, controlled better. And more importantly, maybe one way of controlling it better is again to start, you know, allocating who's actually using all this power. It's great blaming IT, but IT is only using it because the departments want it. So therefore, again, it's the whole reporting back. But the flip side of having all of this information that you're monitoring and recording, it's great. But you actually need management tools that help you understand it because you certainly don't have the time to wade through it all manually. Okay, so should we go into more detail about these, uh, uh, about manageability and how that's achieved? There, yeah, look at the picture. Who is that? Who's that's feet, a fantastic who's, picture. Whose feet are those? Well, we were discussing earlier on whether it was Tony, weren't we? They dropped 10 pence behind this chassis, I think. Was Five it? pence. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it was probably more like a six old pence. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear, yeah. He's found it, yeah. And I'm uh, no. still looking. No. <laughs> yeah, whoever that poor bloke is, uh, uh, then uh, who's, who's underneath that? I mean, this is, uh, we, we joke, but this is real. Yep. This is the real experience. Yep. Yeah. I mean, actually, if you, if, you, if you do a search on, uh, on, on, on the web for any type of picture like that, you'll find many, many different pictures of, of cable designs like that. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier on about if you are deploying a series of racks, 
you're going to have cables. Yep. So what do you do with those cables? And, and, and however you manage them, um, it's going to limit your airflow as well, which is another key point about yeah. you know, managing power and managing cooling. Um, wouldn't it be better if you could actually strip out a lot of those cables? How much less cabling? Well, it's down to design, but you know, again, in a, in a virtualized environment, uh, I think the recommendations from the likes of VMware is you have you know, six network connections, so three redundant pairs, you know, two uh, redundant storage connections. So that's eight for a starter. Hmm. Um, then you have obviously uh, your power cabling, etc. Um, so that could be each server. And in a blade environment, there are 16 of those. Um, you could consolidate that down effectively to two cables at the back of your uh, chassis, mm -hmm. which I think, as it calculates, is 95%. Yes, a number. Whatever but that is, it, but, but I mean, it's... but it's an awful lot less. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that saving at that point. Obviously, the manageability point beyond that, um, you know, is another is another cost saving. Yeah, and the whole risk thing here. I mean, how many of the register audience have had to go into a scenario like this and trying to find a cable? Yes. that needs changing. You, you've been in this, yeah, haven't you? I mean, I'm, I'm looking for money aside, you've yeah. actually been in... It, it's a nightmare. Unplugging things to see what... Yeah, see who screens off. Yeah. Have I got the right cable? Ooh, no. Quick, <laughs> where did it come from? Uh, yeah. yeah. And again, you, you use the phrase network design. You know, this is network evolution. It's not design. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> it's yeah. It's cabling and, evolution. And it happens. You know, yeah, we're talking about automation. So the whole wire once server connectivity and talking about the flexibility of blades. You, know, you, you can actually... The virtual connect... Um, is you know it's HP. Let's get this out in the open. It's HPIP. So the intelligence which was in it, which is within it, mm -hmm. is HPIP. HP intelligence. However, what egresses from that module is a standard network or storage connectivity. Yes. Could so to the outside world, it's a network connection. It's a storage connection. It's nothing. There's nothing funky that goes on in there. Um, and I think that can be a bit of a scare factor about um, the, proprietary the, the, the proprietary elements, the proprietary thing that, that we people think about with blades. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the really important thing here, though, is the bit down in the bottom left hand side about simplifying provisioning. Again, the register audience tell us time after time mm -hmm. that managing networks is complicated and difficult, never mind the physical cabling, just actually managing them. So mm -hmm. anything that simplifies that process makes it more automatable mm -hmm. um, is absolutely you know, a great move forwards. So you've spoken eloquently many times, Tony, on the uh, on the changes in networking within the data center as well. Is there a story that ties into this there? Well, it's the whole idea that we need to change things more quickly, that mm -hmm. we are beginning to move virtual machines around, you know, for resilience or just for service quality changes. You know, there are some services that, that really need to ramp up at particular times of the month or quarter yeah. and down the rest of the time. How do you actually manage all of that? Well, it's one thing moving the VMs around, but it's a completely different thing moving the network connectivity to make sure everything keeps on operating. Mm -hmm. And that's quite often been a big inhibitor for, you know, the people out there trying to keep this stuff working. Because in the past, you put in a network and left it alone unless you really had to touch it. We can't work with that anymore. We need something that makes it simpler to do mm -hmm. without both the physical changes, but also lots of complicated, you know, CLI work to just make something keep working. Mm -hmm. But this is, you know, this is one of the, the challenges within the data center. Often we hear that you know, the, the server team have to talk to the storage team, have to talk to the network team to actually you know, deploy their server. And this can take the number of weeks to come back to the point I made earlier on. Um, the beauty of Blaze is you're actually abstracting those connections into a pool effectively. So you are managing a pool of network and storage connections um, that exist with inside that virtual connect module. So you can allocate your network and your storage on the fly effectively. So you know, if you change a physical server for whatever reason, you can still maintain the same outside identity to the network. If you have a, you know, a service event, if you have to replace something, you still keep the same identity to the outside world by just simply replacing the server. That's the whole wire once connectivity piece. That's that saves time. That's the enables you to move it and change it in minutes rather than weeks. Yeah. And without service interruption as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Let's uh, let's also look uh, on the wider management. This is what yeah. this, this is yours. This does this come from um, the register readers? This comes from register readers again in, in a variety of different ways that we've asked the questions. But it, it's very very simple. You know, people acquire management tools essentially when they get new infrastructure and trying to make an investment case for buying new management tools is hard which is why organizations have got lots of different management tools um, quite often separate ones for each hardware platform 
often you know, multiple management tools for a single hardware platform, just doing different elements of it. And people, frankly, don't have the time to get to grips with all of this, as we saw from the earlier slide. You know, too busy keeping stuff going. So you learn the minimum that you have to to make it work. Um, and this means that the audience out there are the integration point. They're the people that keep it going. So they're the ones that have to make lots of manual changes, which just makes life, one, difficult, two, more expensive, it mm -hmm. eats into people's you know, evening hours, their weekend working, um, and it makes the potential for service interruption go up. So multiple tools is a pain. As I said, you know, people want tools to work better together. Mm. Okay, so I mean this, this sort of thing that we have heard about before, so let's look <coughs> at how Blades address that as well. So, what's the... Um, how do you see this problem then? So the, you know, the bad place obviously is to be on the left there. So we've talked about the, yeah. uh, the siloed problem and the, you know, the way that things are done manually and the way that you rely on Bob to do something particular because only he knows how to do it. Mm. Um, it's not a very good place to be. Um, and you know, some of the, some of the uh, I sound like a, a statistician, but uh, some of the industry an analysis have suggested that you know, three quarters of data centers out there use up to 10 tools to manage the data center, yeah, and they actually found some that managed that had 50 tools, which is crazy. So you've got the storage team, the network team, and the server team all doing things. Well, some elements of it the same, and a lot of it differently. Yeah. And the whole concept of, of one view is to actually um, go to a, a principle of managing processes um, and managing the way activities are performed, and not managing another device. So not about managing those individual devices; it's managing a deployment process, for instance. Why can't you just do this with a bunch of servers? With a bunch of servers? Yes, why do you need... What's the blade angle? Well, the blade angle is... This is probably um, better defined with blades currently, and we will exp expand that into, into our rack servers at the moment, but the, the beauty of having a converged infrastructure effectively in a box, in a chassis, yeah. where you converge your, your storage and your compute and your server edge networking, so again, we will actually move to a point where we have uh, top of rack networking support at the moment, but it's currently confined within inside the chassis effectively. So you can deploy those three elements from one single interface um, uh, rather than having multiple tools doing the same thing. Sure. Uh, and that's down to a hardware or down to virtualization level as well. So this is pre-integrated with things such as uh, uh, virtual, uh, VMware vCenter. So whether you, if you're a heavy vCenter user, um, you can actually manage the hardware through your vCenter plugin into, into HP OneView. Yeah. which is quite a, a big step forward for those customers. The other thing is it's easier to start with a known infrastructure and within a blade you know exactly what's in there. So therefore it makes the whole management of that as a single entity easier to set up in the first place. So as, as Julian said it will be expanding out afterwards to other platforms but you know the obvious starting point is where you know exactly what you've got in the tin. And so yeah. that's why it starts here first. Very much a journey here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the other, the, the very critical point that I would make about this as well is that you know the, this will seamlessly fit into into customers' data centers. This is a, this is built upon uh, the REST API, so a common industry API out there. So you can actually use your existing tools to mine the data that HP OneView manages in your in your environment. Because yeah. I mean, the, the the thing is that if the market split between you know blades and not Blaze. It's not that some people have a data center that's completely made up of Blade servers and other people have none of them there, is mm. it? We're looking in a, a, a mixed environment for more Absolutely. or less everyone. And if we're looking at um, a, a management infrastructure that covers the whole thing, then we're looking for something that throws an umbrella and, over the whole lot. And that's the design. The idea is to keep this open. This yeah. isn't to try and group it in. So we've actually you know, used the, um, the rich legacy. We have the tools we already have and people know and love ILO, our inside control portfolio, uh, portfolio of products. Um, we've used that to actually, you know, to, to build HP One View effectively. I've got some one, early open. questions for you. Oh say, one, 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 one thing but worth they, stressing. They haven't come through. Could you send them through, please, guys? One, one thing yeah. worth stressing here is that this isn't only about data centers. Yes. It's also about <clears> computer rooms. <throat> right. You know, you don't have to have a hunking great data center before things like this become course, important. Yes. You know, you want to be able to automate processes, even if you're only running 10 servers, 20 servers. Mm -hmm. It's the whole idea of automation to reduce risk improve things generally that's important and it doesn't matter how big or how small you are that applies equally across the board and finding out the good operational processes so that if Bob's away you've actually got his knowledge captured in the how-to so that you can rerun it.
-hmm. So you, you know what he was doing, but you just change the parameters on where it applies. Yep. That's the thing that's important here. And they're Capture very simple process. and repeatable exercises. So you know, it's not, it's not going to cover everything, but it takes out some of that mundane. So the guys you've got out there that are, are managing the data center for you aren't spending their time keeping the lights on quite so much. Uh, and they can turn their attention to something a bit more, uh, you know, productive. Or, or maybe get home before, you know, the pubs close. <laughs> <laughs> or have a weekend. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, relying on this is we're talking, we talk about the uh, integration of the IT organisation behind all of this. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a quite a tough nut to crack, isn't it? It's a political nut to crack it's amongst political. everything else. Yes. But, but it's also just working out, well, what are the good operational processes? You know, give me some idea of best practice in here. What could we do differently? And finding the time to do that. Remember, it's that inertia and lack of time and resource to understand what we could do differently. That's the bit that's really important. As you saw from the earlier slides that we had up from the register audience, you know, they know that things need to change to become more integrated, but help me move from where I am now to get there. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest challenge, finding the time to, to change. Yes. And the trigger to change. Let's have a, so let's have a look. Um yeah. Tony, this is uh, yeah. it's definitely one of yours. Yeah. I like the bright colours. Yeah. This is definitely, this, yeah. it's a motherhood and apple pie chart. You know, mm. so, so, and you've heard me say many times, you, how do you move forward? Well, first of all, you've got to know where you are. Yeah. So what are you running, why are you running it, <clears throat> who's using it, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, then look at simplifying your infrastructure if you haven't started already. So blades could be a big part of that. Have a think about it. And um, rationalizing the management tools and processes. You know, people use tools because they've used tools. And actually taking the opportunity to, to cut down on that, or maybe there's one person who's saying, no, I've got to use this, I can't use anything else. Mm -hmm. You've really got to have a good, solid case for keeping more than one management tool. Yeah. Unless you really can't do everything with one. Um, and then get the teams working together. That's political. It's operational more than political, you know, because again, most teams want to work together. Mm. You know, that's seen again in surveys that we've held with the register audience. It's just making the change and finding the time to make the change. And maybe do you have some infrastructure change trigger that could maybe help facilitate some of this stuff? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's part of the knowing where you are already, Julian. A, really basic, yeah. a really basic, basic thing. You would think it, it was basic, yeah. wouldn't you? But yeah, that's not often the case, unfortunately. <laughs> well, yes, that's the thing. Now, some people might go and have a look and see where they are already. And they're looking at um, different hardware generations of blades. Mm. And uh, is, is this, does this become a problem that you, you know, that uh, if you've got first generation or second generation blades, you uh, know, the, the sorts of things we're talking about aren't really accessible to you? Uh, well, it's not necessarily a problem. And I think the, you know, the, the, the general point on that would be is that, you know, we will support um, our generation one blades in our current product and our generation eight blades in our original enclosure that we had. Over the course of time, there have been some enhancements to the mid plane with inside that enclosure to deal with some of the technologies that we talked about, yeah. which weren't there. So some of the performance related capability, um, you know, faster InfiniBand, et cetera, across that mid, uh, that mid plane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you, analogy from a car, a car analogy, you know, you can put a Porsche 911 engine in a Beetle, but would you? And would you expect it to actually run as you would in a traditional Porsche. So you can do these things, but there's always going to be some kind of caveat on the way that it's going to perform. There will be some kind of limitation if you try and put a Gen 8 blade in a, G, a, G, a first generation chassis, which you know, in most cases, I don't think customers do that. I think they see the benefit and the ability to turn um, ROI and savings and actually the performance benefits you can get from later servers actually just into deploying new infrastructure. And usually they have a reason to want to change. They want to get that ultimate performance level, so they will change. But if they're not actually running the fastest and greatest, then they can quite easily continue as they are. That's really not an issue. Mm. And that last point's really important. We know that people don't do big, you know, rip and replace changes. It's a matter of we've got a new project coming along. How can we start putting in something new to deal with that requirement? but gives us a base from which to grow. And clearly, you know, blades could be a good opportunity to do that, yeah. to make that change, give you a starting point for putting in something that's much more manageable, potentially covering a much broader sweep than just, you know, your single siloed business service. At a very basic level, Tony, do you expect to see more blades in the future? I think that the whole use of blades and converged systems generally will yes. go up. So yes, absolutely. Because again, it makes logical sense in so many different ways. It's just a matter of you know making the change. And we're now up to you know late 15 year generations of blades. So a lot of the initial teething thoughts and you know, cost issues around blades versus racks have you know contracted enormously. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. No, let's have a look at the. Um, this is HP's vision of the the process, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's just another, you know, so another depiction of a of a journey. But you know, we we were talking about people with installed base of rack servers. We know there are thousands and thousands out there. I know people that st still to this day are, are running generation one servers out there and we still support those quite happily. But is actually that the most efficient way for those customers to be running that business? You know, And almost that picture, you, you know, you're looking at being able to condense that number of um, blades, sorry, rack servers down into a single blade enclosure. So mm -hmm. you gain a more efficient setup and you're saving space and you're saving power. Do you really get that? Do people fully populate their um, their enclosures? And so, I mean, they the, do. The, I, I see the complaint that, I, that I've seen over and over again is people say, you actually don't get that space thing because you have them half full and when they're half full, well, it's basically the same. And quite often that's down to, down to choice as to how yeah. people tend to deploy them. But you do get people that deploy full um, chassis full mm -hmm. and you do get people that obviously will buy them. And again, because of their modular modularity, you can slot in future uh, upgrades and mix have storage, you know, network type uh, blades, um, graphic blades as well that we can fit inside that chassis. Mm -hmm. And then moving on to the uh, the, the, you know, the big boxes. That and we talked about some of these before, yeah. So yeah. effectively, it's a journey. You know, we, you know, people are on a journey. It's up to you where you're heading on that. You know, what your intentions are. If you want to go to the cloud, you know, we, we the, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, the foundation of our our, our higher end products there are based on on blade servers. So you're mm -hmm. building on a common uh, product set, uh, a common intelligence. So we'll obviously we can help you on that journey. Um, but the, the point is, there's nothing different about effectively where you're heading. Mm. The, the interesting point is also, you know, as we said, it's not just about big data centers, but, you know, blades can come in relatively small enclosures now as well, so that you don't need to have, you know, thousands of physical or virtual servers that you're running before. They what might do, become what, what are you saying by relatively small? Where do we come in on Well, this? I mean, it, it, it can be down to usage, but, you know, a typical breaking point and, and where it becomes cost effective from a sheer pur purchase point of view would be yeah. four or five blades. But there may be instances where you actually, you know, how you know what your particular setup is, that it may well be more beneficial from, uh, from the outset to actually purchase a blade enclosure. Mm -hmm. it's, it's horses, of course, but certainly for about four and or again, five. How you do the accounting servers. is really important because you've got the power side, the management side, the service side, the flexibility. So all of those are really hard to put financial values on. But just on a pure acquisition cost, you know, it's down now. When blades first came out, I think people were talking about 20, 30, 40 servers being the cutover point now it's down to five six seven eight yes now and lots of people are running that even in small businesses you know sure. easily yep, absolutely yeah. that's fine we've got about three minutes left uh, tony so i just want to um i want, I want to go to you first on this because always in this sort of, sort of planning if people are going to change their decision making get out of the inertia then you're going to have to make some kind of plan to know that you're making yep. the right decision how do we get to that Finding the time to actually sit back and take a look to see what's out there. As we, we mentioned earlier, we'll find out what exactly are you running, you know, and why are you running it? Is there anything you can switch off in the first place? Yeah. yeah. But then, okay, we've got maybe a new project coming along that is going to lead to some investment. What are the alternatives to doing things the way we've always done them, including blades? So just it really comes down to finding time to do a bit of reading, um, understand what you need, why you need it, and. Does this actually fit in with the way we expect IT to change inside the business as well? Mm -hmm. But it really does come to just find a bit of time. It doesn't have to be weeks. You know, just a few few hours here and there to think about doing something differently. Yeah. What's on the spreadsheet, Julian? That people tend to leave off if they're going to make if they're going to they're make a spreadsheet and it's going to lead to a decision. This is mm. a business positive decision to uh, use blades more than we have done in the past. What are they not taking into account that you wish they would? Well, I think maybe they need to look at the whole, uh, as a whole, as a concept, rather than thinking of it as something different, it's still yeah. compute. Um, it's compute in a different format. Um, but, you know, as we've covered today, you know, that it's a far more efficient way of actually, uh, of actually deploying servers. Mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier, you know, the, the process we currently have is broken. You, you, you can't continue to fill racks with rack servers or town servers. You have to look at a different way of actually doing it. So you know, mm -hmm. if you've not looked at Blaze for a while, um, I would suggest you do. There are ROI tools, and unfortunately it's not linked up there, but we can obviously uh, point people at those. Um, where you can actually get, plug get in, in your get in touch with you if they want the tools, yeah. the ROI yeah. tools. Yeah. Plug in your details and it will, it will spit out a result effectively to tell you you know, whether you're a good case or not. But, you know, I can't believe out there that people are, you know, as they're deploying at the moment, that they can continue deploying that way. 
Yes. Do you Pe think people know that yeah. putting stuff together by hand takes time. It usually means that you have to go through things more than once. So it was okay in the past when there were no alternatives. There are different ways of doing it now, and it's just really trusting. You know, and does it does it work for us? And am I confident it's going to work for us? Mm. Uh, Tony, we must, uh, we've more or less finished our sort of summer season of RegCast <laughs> now, uh, uh, now, and we've spoken a huge amount this year about uh, management and the yep. importance of it. By the time we reconvene in a couple of months' time, and, you know, and, and we can move going into next year, do you think things will really start to change? <sighs> things tend to change slowly, yeah, because we're not building from new. It's not like you know mobile phones when they first came out, nobody had one. Everybody's got IT in their business. So it will always take time to change. But I think that it's not going to be overnight revolutions, it's just going to be step by step by step, you know, the way sensible red readers always work anyway. Thanks very much. We're out of time guys. Thank you very much everyone. We'll see you again in a couple of months. From the Register, goodbye. <laughs>